This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Brickell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work, and this week I'm joined by editor Sarah Taylor, uh, who recently worked on the film Hey Victor, uh, which will have its world premiere at the this year's Tribeca Film Festival. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I guess my first question for you is, what attracted you to this project? <laughs> Well, uh, the fact that it was a feature film that had this mockumentary style, I am lucky as a as an editor based in Edmonton, Alberta, that I get to do scripted, I get to do doc, but over the last, I'd say, five-ish years, doc has really been where things have landed in Edmonton. So I have this really strong doc background, I have some sketch comedy background, so it sort of merged uh, a lot of my experience into one and it was you know local people working on the film and yeah so, so did you know uh, Cody beforehand then or I didn't know I didn't know Cody personally I feel like I know Cody really well now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we all do after the film <laughs> <laughs> yes but um but a lot of the people that worked on the crew and some of the producers I've worked with in the past and um, yeah yeah so I have to ask because it reminded me a lot of Fubar, <laughs> Fubar too, in the sense of like it's a hoser yeah. trying to <laughs> overcome his challenges, <laughs> and I'm wondering what is it about Alberta that attracts that story uh, for us <laughs> as Canadians? Well, uh, it's a very Alberta thing. It's so funny connected to Fubar because like I remember when I first came up out of school, I was working as an intern at a production house called studio post and FUBAR was being finished there. And so the guys from FUBAR came in to work and I was this young student and they were like, like their characters. They were like, oh, really? <laughs> then there was these, this, you know, I remember this big woman came in with these tattoos and she was like a biker lady and she's real tough. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And so I'm watching the film as they're anyway, sidetrack, but yes, I don't know. I feel like it's, those people exist in Alberta and so, but they probably exist in other places too yeah, like yeah. they're not you think about too. like trailer park boys as well like there's just these like these characters that exist and so maybe it, they're I should fun. expand on the question say what is it about Canada <laughs> yeah. that we want to essentially poke fun at ourselves because if you think about it like there's uh Shorzy that's out right now yeah. there's this there's trailer park boys there's the um uh, the two hosers from SCTV. Yeah. Right. That's where it all started. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we just like, I think that's a very, I don't know, very, almost is it a Canadian thing where we're like kind of saying sorry because we're, we're poking poking fun at ourselves. We're like, sorry, this is how we are sometimes. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I almost wondered fun. if it's like, oh my gosh, people find that funny outside. Like yes. Americans find it funny and they're like, oh, they recognized us. <laughs> so oh, like... totally. I grew up in a household in the projects in East Harlem. There's a program that WNET, the public television station, to get more people of color behind the camera, in the editing room, doing sound, writing scripts. When they put me in a dark room and they showed me how to use the splicer and the rewinds, I felt this big sigh of relief. This sense of, wow, I found my space. The editing part of filmmaking is the real nuts and bolts of what makes films come to life. You can ask Spielberg, you can ask Tarantino, you can ask Spike. When you sit here, this is where the proof is in the pudding. I'm Sam Pollard, and this is my class on documentary editing. So then I guess one of the things, because when I think of these sort of documentary style comedies, a lot of them can be like, I think of The Office was heavily scripted with a bit of ad living. Mm -hmm. And then there's mm -hmm. others where it's, you know, like uh, best in show where it's like 100% ad lib. So where does this fall on that spectrum? Um, there's definitely 
a good solid script but there was lots of opportunity for improv like and cody just there'd be scenes where cody took it like real far and i you know moments where i was like this is really funny where then we had to like pull back because it made him like really unlikable so it was definitely a balance but there's a lot of really funny and you have colin mackery as like in there as a guest and like um so there's there was so many moments a lot of the the things where people were like kind of freaking out those were all just like ad-libbed kind of yeah. improv moments of which one's the funniest which one do we take yeah well because colin mockery is a legendary improver know, yeah improver. so <laughs> i i was wondering because it seemed you know compared to kate the woman who plays kate who's actually looks like she's been trained and <laughs> is going through the <laughs> the uh, traditional acting process. totally yeah she so, was fun too she did some good improv as well oh, yeah. and uh i loved and her reactions like I love being like, okay, I gotta go look. What is Kate doing right now? What is she? How is she reacting to this right now? She had some good, funny reactions. Well, I was wondering, like, um, is with her performance, there's a couple of things about her performance that I really thought was good. Um, but you know, we talk, we talked via Facebook about the the scenes, and you brought up the the scene afterwards after the screening. Um. And what I thought was really interesting, or what I wanted to know from that, I guess I should start with, is what were the what was the range and delivery in her rushes? She was pretty solid in like that awkward kind of gangly, like I'm here to like serve Cody in the mm-hmm. most things, right at the beginning, and then I thought it was really cool, really her in that scene where she really starts to just like let it out. Um, I don't know. I thought she did such a good job. I felt that her rushes were really compelling and I really enjoyed cutting that scene because we got to see Kate like stand up for herself and like voice her own uh, feelings and just like tell Cody to fuck off. (laughs) Right? Like, sorry, sorry. I don't know. Sorry. a lot, but, um, (laughs) and so yeah, there was some that like, she was really intense in moments and he was super intense in things. So we had to really pare back some of his response to it again that fine line of like how much do we want to hate our main, our main character but how much do we need to show that he's like kind of a dick and then has to transform right so mm-hmm. it was a fine balance cutting that that scene and it was much longer like of course your our first cut it was and that whole that whole section has adjusted and changed a lot but it was a you know it was a little more drawn out and then it was like how how uncomfortable do we want to make the audience feel but how do but we want them to feel what Kate's feeling and anyway I think it came out in a to a pretty good balance in the end i just like well, her she's good she's when good. i rewatched it this morning the thing that sort of stood out for me is like the importance of the scene that comes right before it to set up yeah this scene, which is her reveal that she's white and, <laughs> and, and which is like also the obvious. hilarious <laughs> like <laughs> i'll enter name kate colombo like there's just so many yeah. funny like they did a really good job the comedy of the writers was great they did a really good job and even just like wardrobe with what she was wearing like that that part was just quite hilarious um and just like how she was trying to share something that was really important to her and how she felt and like just cody being like well, come on whatever right just really showed like okay you really don't care about me that devastation mm-hmm. that she was feeling her identity was shattered and then her best friends not loving her and is at that shattered so you can see it bubbling anyway yeah, yeah. well it, there's a couple of jokes that are sort of set up throughout that are quite funny but i'm wondering in that scene like one of the things i noticed was uh you very much focused on kate from for perspective um so when you were when you were molding the scene was there many variations in that like did you have one where it was more balanced did you have one where it was more cody i feel like i always just i naturally like instinctually felt like i needed to see kate i needed to hear because we saw so much of her stepping back like so many literally moments where she's like stepping out of the frame or stepping away from you know hiding behind the balloon hiding behind the exactly and i was just yeah as i watched it and I read this, I read the scene and I watched the, the dailies and I just was drawn to see her actually speak. And maybe, I don't know, maybe because I'm a woman, <laughs> like partly, like, I don't know, there's sometimes that like 
it was maybe subconscious in a way too, where I'm like, no, I need to hear what cow's Kate feeling and all this. Like she got fucked over and I need to make sure she's getting a voice here. So I don't know. I think it was always kind of leaning to Kate. So was the scene, what were the challenges in the scene then? Just again, again, like how much of drunk Cody do we see? Um, And like the scene did continue a bit that got cut out where like he kind of chases after her be like no no come back but then like again doubles down on something else and it's just like so letting him sit there and be like no like her walk away and him just be like you know um and then yeah like kind of shortening taking some things out tightening it up that was the biggest thing out of the whole film was like i think the assembly was like two and a half hours (laughs) so really what gets lost what gets tightened what do we really need well, and, and this is probably falls under the colorist more, but I'm I'm interested in knowing because I noticed that she essentially is uh, the way she's lit. She's always backlit. So she's dark in the whole scene. Like yeah. you can still make her out, but it seems that she's much darker. Was that intentional in, the, in terms of like the lighting? You, you guys didn't try to darken it on purpose or push it up? Mm, it was no, it was pretty dark in the scene when it was shot. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know what the intention was when they were out there. We didn't talk about that. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, I want to jump to the pawn shop, um, which has one of my favorite <laughs> jokes in it. But I'm which wondering one? what what made this scene so fun? Oh, those you? two guys were hilarious. And they had such good improv, too. Like, okay, so what did they improv? Of, uh, there's that joke. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but where they're like, okay, this is this is worth five dvds and like that line always changed like okay you can go grab the whatever feather or whatever right like there was always a a change in that and like what the lawnmower would be worth um and just how they interacted with each other the the two guys and then and then when them standing outside the door that's my like wait a minute i don't want to there's a joke there's a really good joke and i don't know if this is a joke that you that you liked when they're standing outside the door and they're like comparing themselves to germans yeah that's yeah. the joke i think uh, <laughs> made me laugh just, really hard and there was a lot of variations of that too like they just were standing there for i don't know a couple minutes just rattling off stuff so was there something that ended up on the cutting room floor in this film <clears throat> that you're just like i really wish this could go in but oh my gosh there was the story there's whole scenes that we removed yeah like what what kind of scenes um there was an well you kind of saw it in the flashback of uh them the audience getting mad at cody during the first screening of the film Mm -hmm. um and so there was a whole there was a whole scene there of him coming out after the screening and talking to the crowd and the crowd being like you know mad at him for what he felt what he said what he did and what he created and then him kind of having his retort back and like some really like real raunchy stuff too but it was funny but again it was like not really necessary like yeah. it just needed you needed a reaction you need to know that what he created was bad yeah. um and people were mad but did, it was there were some gems in there did cody actually tell you what the film was about when that he had created or did that stay secret you know how like sometimes yeah like i think about the radio head one where they all knew what the guy said in the music video but no one else knows nobody else did they no actually we never and i never even thought to ask oh what did he create that was so bad um we just had some really funny like that was one of the things that cut out they created these really funny graphics that were playing like the credits leading up to when the film would start and it was just like credit after credit of cody's name like cody doing this and cody doing this. so that, like that was a little funny. like a student like film that. basically <laughs> exactly like a student film yeah 100 percent. so that was uh yeah no there, but was, there was oh, so funny there was a jumping back to that pawn shop scene when the german chases them outside <laughs> there is a really interesting tonal shift mm-hmm. where or like sorry once he's negotiated with them um there's a really different tonal shift. So like when you're working in, in comedy, like usually, sorry, let me take the back. Like usually when you're working on a film, like the set deck plays a role, the cinematography, all, everything sort of creates a role in creating the tone for the scene. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting here is we're in this comedic film and it's like funny, funny, funny. And then all of a sudden the delivery changes 
and there's this like tonal shift so like what were the rushes like for the german like how did you guys work this do did you have different cuts that just didn't work like what was it that worked for this or got it to so work? the german stuff there was like a lot longer too again talking about uh having to cut things back but the scene when he chases them out there was a bit more there before they go back in um and then being in the thing that the the one thing that we had to kind of finesse is like actually showing cody be scared mm-hmm. of the guy right and so and then to try to make sure we get enough kate being like no no we can't do that into there um and and like there's this under un i don't know if people know this but like there seems to be a, a fast Germans in like actual life have a fascination with indigenous people from mm-hmm. Canada. So that was like an interesting. So like, there's a lot of things that are in this film that are like actual, like true things that happen in the world. And so that was one of those moments where it's like pulling in, like you could see Cody's like untrustworthiness of like, what there's a German here. Like I'm, I'm out of here. This is like, no, yeah. it's not safe for me and stuff like that. So, and then of course him being so enthusiastic and like loving smoke signals and like knowing the lines and then Cody like, okay, this is in like, so yeah, it was like an important scene that we did massage a lot because there was another like component that was in there with Kate and an interaction, like a kind of story of Kate and her brother talking about, you know, the, the relationship she has with Cody. And so that ended up coming out because it didn't really need to be there. So there's like so many moments of moving parts within that scene that were long and then we just had to contract like shorten it up so what was the real cody and i have to say for the viewer who hasn't seen this like cody is cody in the film (laughs) (laughs) um Um, yeah but what because he he wrote this he directed it which is ironic because he's trying to write and direct a film in the film um (laughs) but how do you like how much how comfortable was he with removing scenes and reworking scenes like was there scenes that you had to sort of convince him to remove or what What was that relationship like? Um, he is not like him in, in the movie. Like he's much more down to earth <laughs> and not as <laughs> intense. Um, it, it was really a unique situation when cutting this because we were in the height of like, I think Omicron or something. So everything was virtual. And this was before we had um, like Zoom was a little bit better with playback. So we used mm-hmm. this other system called Source source something um which worked really well but so even though cody was partly in edmonton for uh post he also was he's in a new marvel show coming out soon so he was like going and doing training and going to atlanta like so he wasn't always around yeah um can i ask which marvel film he's coming out in uh he's an echo oh the series at least i i was assuming he still is (laughs) <laughs> I should check, but he that's what he was doing um and so uh yeah so that was it wasn't like a typical where you really get to sit with your director and get to know them on a more personal level when you're in the suite together but then he's in the film too and there's bits of him that I'm like so I felt like I got to know him in a way yeah um he was really good and he worked really um, closely with his co-writer Sam Miller and so they they were really good about like discussing things and then they had a um Joshua Jackson was another uh, producer who also came into the edit. So that you, often it was, um, it was uh, Cody and Sam and Joshua coming in, and we're all you know talking together and working through scenes together. And so he never, Cody was never precious of like, oh my god, I must keep that and yeah. oh my performance. Like he was never that was never his his style at all. So, which is very refreshing because I can imagine that would be really challenging as a writer director. And then it's also like a bit of his, some of it's his story. Like he was, mm-hmm. he, he was young Victor in Smoke Signals. So like, yeah, this is part of his life and he's been wanting to create something like this for a long time. So it's yeah. very, yeah, it's, it almost feels like, uh, it almost feels like having you on as with your experience as a documentary editor was because they they were like we're gonna shoot this as much stuff as possible oh my gosh (laughs) but you how what was your what was your footage count oh i don't remember off the top of my head now but i do know that yeah like i said our assembly was like two and a half 
then we got it down to like a 150 and that was still long so like and then it just like kept getting shorter and shorter which needed to be like you can't have a two and a half hour comedy like that would just be this style of comedy just wouldn't work um but it was just getting yeah i guess it was good to have those things because then you're really what what jokes land the best um what's actually part of the story that we really need to keep and so that's why like characters were taken out and but i guess that's the nature of most yeah. films i suppose <laughs> but there was a lot of content yes now how did you like i think about the intervention scene and i'm wondering what what was planned in terms of the music and the mm. the watermarks Mm -hmm. and what was sort of like in post you discovered so it was always going to be oh now i can what is the name of the because we had a temp track in there of course i can't Mm -hmm. remember what the show was uh i can't remember which show we referred to but it was always going to be that because it was shot where we changed the aspect ratio Mm -hmm. we put the letterbox up um it was always intended to be moments where it would drop into like intervention show and be like more serious and then pop back out. I didn't do the graphics, so that was like I actually rewatched the film last night just to see it with audio, with color and music and everything. And um, it was really fun to watch again and remind me of like all the things we did because I I cut this last year, so it's been a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was always the intention to to pop in and pop out. Um, and again, it was a moment too with Colin being a great improver. Is like how how intense is he in the like not filming part of the tv show where he gets Mm -hmm. mad about the door being locked not locked and freaks out of the crew and then he comes back into character of like i'm going to save you it's intervention moment right so yeah yeah, but the music was always kind of campy and silly um from the beginning and i wish i could really i wish i could remember the name of the show that we we used as the temp music but it was like a a competition style show that we were playing with well and that was that was the thing is it sort of like you said it pops in and out yeah and so I was wondering like was that part of the plan or part of the yeah it was effort. always part of the plan but how much of it did we keep it like how much did we stay within the intervention part and I thought one of the fun parts for me was like the timing of including the camera operators that were shooting the like the tv show slash documentary mm. um and there was like just some funny moments where you know Cody looks at the camera and you you know, we, we see him talking to the camera operators and they're like reacting yeah. as another character. That was always fun. Yeah. Or Kate yells at them to get out of the way. Exactly. That was. <laughs> yeah. Now, what was. Okay. So you rewatched this yesterday. What was something that you forgot that you were like surprised when you saw it or. um, Just, I just loved hearing the music. Cause like, that's always the thing that I don't always get to, to hear like the composed music that comes in so the some of the moments where the music came in was really fun um just some of the jokes i just forget like there's one scene where his like mother-in-law calls him a dink and i every even from the (laughs) from like the first cut i just thought it was so funny and then yeah i just seen it again last night it still made me laugh and it's just silly like she just says dink but the way she said it just (laughs) always made me laugh and that's actually cody's real mom like in real life oh yeah that's a little (laughs) fun yeah now here's the weird thing though because like okay so my daughter is six and she's at that point where she's like oh you guys are watching tv at night and keeps wanting to come out and mm. see we're watching it <laughs> and i'm like you can't come out while i watch this and she's like oh is it scary i won't be scared don't worry i won't be scared i'm like no no just, <laughs> i don't know what's gonna happen next <laughs> not suitable for kids <laughs> um so and i was like there's a lot of cussing after like the first 10 minutes i was just like when she but- snuck out it was like so that was that yeah. was something sorry to interrupt but that was something that i realizing i probably felt like i became immune to the f word because as i was watching it last night i was like i don't remember them being so many fucks in this movie but like i'm like we could be counting this like you count yeah. kills for john wick right like, yeah you know, like f word drinking game or something <laughs> oh you wouldn't make it past 10 minutes no anyway sorry <laughs> but what i was going to ask is because i feel like a lot of the editors I talk to, they will show it to their spouses. They'll show it to their kids. They'll show it to like friends to try and get (laughs) feedback. Did you have to like curtail that around your kids and be like, sorry, you can't come into the room while I'm editing. You can't. So there was one, there's one moment because I was cutting some of this during the summer and there was a moment where, oh no, maybe it's during Christmas break. I can't remember now. 
my daughter walked in to the scene where uh, Cody is naked. And I was like, get out of the scene. It's where he's naked, though. <laughs> I know, but like, so that was like uh, awkward. I'm like, what are yeah. you doing in here? Like trying to t- turn down the machine. Um, no, she, uh, no, she definitely didn't get to sit in the edit suite. She's often in my edit suite. She actually created, I mean, you can see the little chair there. She created herself <laughs> a little uh, edit mini suite edit herself. suite to work next to me. And she'll like sometimes tell me like, mom, you got to take out that extra. She'll say cricket noise. I don't know where the cricket noises are coming from anyway. So she's often part of the edit, but this was definitely not a film that she was <laughs> part of the edit. Now, yeah. would you, as a parent, would you, I always wonder this because some parents I talk to, I, you know, when you're like, would you encourage your kid to go into the film if they were interested? They're like, no it's too crazy in industry and others are like, yeah, of course. W- what would you do? hundred percent. Yeah. I think, yeah. oh yeah. I think for her, she's because she's been like, she's literally been in my edit suite since she was born. Like yeah. when I, I took a quote unquote mat leave, but then had an opportunity to work on an episode of a show and I got excited. So she like, so I took it and she sat, she didn't sit, she was sleepy. She'd take naps beside me, like on the floor, play on the floor. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so it's been fun as a parent to watch her understand how movies are made. So she knows that movies are not real and TV is not real. And so like we can shape it how we want. And sometimes she'll come and sit with me and be like, oh, you should get her to say this. Like she's already kind of made this connection of how you can get people mm-hmm. to do in the film and television what you need them to do. And um, I don't know, she has a great creative imagination. So I would want her to totally go down a path if she wants to in this world and like my husband's a musician so we're both like kind of in the arts and yeah 100 percent. i love and I, I also love what i do and she sees that she knows that like they, well her and my husband always joke like oh mom's talking about editing again like i'm always <laughs> editing is like what i do <laughs> so yeah. um it would be i think it would be strange of me to be like no you shouldn't do this because i love it so much so yeah well, what i found interesting sort of what you were saying there is like with my daughter when we're watching cartoons or anything, like I will reference the actor doing the voice or I will talk about the mm-hmm. process mm-hmm. to the point where I feel that it's le- there's a lot of stuff that she's watched that I'm like, oh, that's going to be too scary. And she's fine with it because she knows yep. the process in a sense, yeah. in a weird way. So like she watched the late, you know, the Harry Potters and we're like, these right. are going to be terrifying. And she's like, nah. Yeah, that's the same thing. My daughter's been watching like, yeah total movie like she's watched it she had a harry potter on her own harry potter marathon over yeah christmas break like and she's seven so like they're yeah her, our daughters are close to the same age um and i'm and she always will talk like we talk about how movies made even one day we went we went for coffee we had a little coffee date and she's like mom let's talk about i think it was the pokemon movie so this is mm-hmm. a while back Mom, it was really neat, The like, how the voices were used. Like, she was kind of, ana- like, we sat there and analyzed a film. And she was, mm-hmm. like, five at the time. So I'm like, this is really cool, like, to like, have these discussions about how movies are made and what how it makes you feel when you watch something. And we always talk about the voice. Like, she'll recognize voice. She's like, hey, that's the voice of so-and-so. I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's the actor so-and-so or whatever, right? So I don't know. I think it's fun. Yeah. Now, I have one last question for you. What would you say is your favorite Guilty Pleasure film or TV show to watch? <laughs> Okay, so it's a toss up. No, okay, current my current one, my current guilty pleasure is selling sunset on Netflix. What's that? It's ridiculous. Gordon is just ridiculous. It is a re- real estate reality show set in LA where they sell like a bajillion dollar homes and they wear the, these women wear the most ridiculous clothes, but and it's it's just reality TV trashy but there's something about it i've watched there's six seasons i've watched them all and typically i'm not a reality show person but there's something yeah. about selling sunset that just... so that's my guilty wow. like trashy tv show yeah yeah wow. that's it. sounds amazing <laughs> you should, well if you want to, well, the I'm houses gonna, are cool i'm gonna check it out so uh um... yeah, season six has the most outrageous outfits that you're like what is happening but <laughs> um yeah it's, it's fun well thank you so much for letting me interview you today yeah, thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah, and that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.